the people of sake actually brought me into sake. Back in 1988, this place was actually in Ginza on the main drag. At first it was kind of soy sauce, it was miso. To the point where it actually changed my life. New Year's Day 1989. Uh, not just sake as a beverage, but all the culture and history and Welcome back. You are once again listening to an episode of Sake on Air, the world's number one podcast for everything sake and shochu, broadcasting from the Japan Sake and Shochu Information Center here in Tokyo and made possible with the fantastic support of the Japan Sake and Shochu Makers Association. My name is Justin Potts and I will be on the mic today. While I don't have any uh, partners in crime uh, today. I do have a very special guest. Um, those who have been listening to the show for a while might recognize this voice a little bit. Today I am joined by Mr. Stephen Lyman. Stephen, how are you doing today? Good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Glad to be back on the show. Yeah. Thanks so much for making the trek up here. That was a, uh, this was rather impeccable timing. It worked out, didn't it? It worked out very, very well. For those who aren't familiar um, with uh, what's keeping Stephen busy and what he's up to, uh, you can go ahead and pause this really briefly and jump back to episode number 14 when we talk uh, everything, when Mr. Christopher Pellegrini and Stephen uh, chat all things shochu and we dig into Stephen's uh, origin stories and all that good stuff. So you can learn a little bit more about where he came from and how he ended up here uh, by jumping back there. But we're here for another very special reason, that being that he that Stephen has just released his first book, The Complete Guide to Japanese Drinks. Yes. Uh, so actually, the official release date, at least in the U.S., is October 1st, although I started seeing social media around it in the middle of September. So I guess Amazon, Amazon shipped early. Okay. And uh, the official release date in Japan is October 27th, although I've heard books are already in country. And uh, as far as other countries, I'm not sure when it'll be released, but it's it's expected to have a worldwide distribution. Excellent. That is super exciting. Congratulations, first of all. Thank you very much. First and foremost, that is absolutely fantastic. Um, so right now, you are one of a very limited number of Mr. So- Shochu's. Um, all of a sudden, we have a complete guide to Japanese drinks. That's right. That is a, that is a huge leap. It is. So I have a co-writer on this, uh, Chris Bunting. And Chris actually used to live in Tokyo, and he was a, a journalist here. And he had written basically like a pocket guide to drinking in Japan. And uh, so he and I had been in communication for a long time. And I had this idea of basically doing a comprehensive guide to shochu and awamori, which are the two traditional distilled spirits uh, here in Japan. And Chris already had the relationship with Tuttle, the publisher. And so he agreed to work with me on pitching a guide to Shochu and Awamori, and Tuttle said, we're not sure that the world's ready for that, but if you'd like to do a complete guide to Japanese drinks, we'd consider that. So we quickly polished up the pitch and sent it back, and they went for it. And so uh, Chris is no longer working as a journalist. He actually is now back in the UK with a completely different career. Uh, He's also very analog. So what was fascinating about working with him is uh, we'd never met. All of this was done over email. And then I finally had a chance once the once the proposal was accepted to go visit him in Yorkshire in the UK, and he had all of the all of these notebooks from his original research. So they're all handwritten notebooks, just like you'd expect a journalist to have. And then he had a hard drives full of old photography that he had used. And so basically, I downloaded about twenty thousand photos, and I took all of his workbooks, all his notebooks, and took them back to New York with me. And so I ended up uh, taking those original. Uh, notes and and the photography then i did a lot of my own photography and then working with some friends and other photographers i knew getting the photography for the book and i was able to put together this guide um and obviously i knew the shochu and awamori which are two of the chapters but i knew virtually nothing about umeshu uh or kajitsushu like fruit liqueurs here in japan i didn't even know how they were made uh and then for sake i i was nervous i mean there are so many great people working in sake and that know much more about sake than I'll ever know. Uh, and so I, I, I le- leaned on a number of them to, to get information. Uh, and then I also did my Kiki Sake Shi simply because I knew that I needed to at least know something about it uh, as I undertook this. Uh, and that, so that's the first half of the book basically is all Japanese alcohol traditions. And the second half is actually Western traditions adopted to Japan. So whiskey, wine, beer, and then I finish up with cocktails. So it was a really fun project, and uh, I learned a lot more about all these different 
other kinds of drinks. I mean, I'd been drinking beer and wine and whiskey for a long time, but I had never really, you know, gone deep on them. And it was a really fun experience. I mean, you kind of answered it a little bit in the fact that, you know, this is sort of what Tuttle pitched back at you guys. But why this particular book now? Was there something, is that, was that something, is it more on the publisher end where they were like, like you said, there was, oh, maybe the market's not ready for this. What were, what were they looking for? Um, and what, why, why this specific book right now? Sure. So I think, you know, part of it is the timeliness. I mean, so many people are now coming to Japan. The, the number of tourists has just boomed. And it's only getting better or worse, depending on how you look at it with, you know, the Rugby World Cup is happening essentially now. Yeah. And then, you know, Tokyo Olympics coming next year. Uh, so there, there's definitely a, a desire or a need for English language information about things in Japan. Uh, and people like to drink. Mm-hmm. So it seemed like a, a, a good fit. For me, of course, it, it was a vehicle to introduce Shochu and Awamori more broadly because there's really unknown drinks outside of Japan. Uh, where other everybody, not everybody, most people know sake and, and plum wine or umeshu, but most people don't know these other traditions. When you sit down and say, okay, we're going to write the book on Japanese beverages, how did you determine how wide to cast your net? Were there certain guidelines? Were there certain things that you wanted to make sure you that you got in to the, into the conversation? What was your sort of guiding right. compass in that? No, I think that's a great question. You know, I think when, when I started, I... I wanted to make sure that we really try to un- understand what people are drinking in Japan and what, what, what is being made in Japan. And that, that's somewhat a challenge, you know, when we talk about Western traditions adopted to Japan, I think, I think we really use the d- dividing point of the opening of Japan when Commodore Perry sailed into Edo Bay. But almost all alcohol traditions in Japan were adopted. So shochu and awamori are both distilled alcohols. Distillation was developed in Persia. So distillation traveled at some point to Japan. Uh, And there were other distilled alcohols that existed before shochu and awamori. So somehow the distillation got here. Japanese made it a very uniquely Japanese style of beverage. But distilled spirits were not something native to Japan. Mm. Uh, Even sake, you know, they were making rice wine in China, uh, you know, well before Japan. Uh, but the Japanese figured out a way to make it elegant and beautiful and nuanced and yeah. everything that it is. And so it was really, it's really more a matter of recency, what would be considered native to Japan versus what would be adopted. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned a second there, you wanted you want to take a look at what people were drinking. What are people drinking in Japan right now? A lot of highballs. A lot of, highballs. <laughs> a lot of cheap whiskey and soda. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Which are delicious. They're refreshing. They're easy drinking. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I enjoy them, but it's, I think it's also hurting the traditional alcohols. The most common thing for people to drink here is beer. Mm. Like, that's worldwide. I think France is maybe the only country where something else is more common than, yeah. than beer. But, you know, the, the shochu and, and sake makers are struggling with domestic sales. And so I think getting the word out internationally was, a, was an important goal with this book as well. Uh, because if exports can help, you know, sustain those industries, then we're not going to lose these beautiful small makers who are you know, making really interesting products. Right now you're starting to see a lot of, whether it's sake, whether it's shochu, whether it's, you know, a lot of these different things, they're trying to find simpler ways to get people to consume those products because they're, they think people aren't as quote unquote interested in the traditional product. Right. And, you know, I think that it's true, true of the West as well. You know, I think perhaps those of us who live in large urban cities and you know that have been rejuvenated we we live in a bubble in a way but most people are still drinking adjunct lagers most people are still drinking cheap wine Mm -hmm. you know no a lot of people aren't looking for single barrel whiskey expressions or you know single vineyard wine expressions things like that that's really something that i think more urban elites tend to do right and so it's no surprise then in japan that people are drinking haposhu which is a very low malt beer substitute essentially or, you know, uh, chew highs, you know, which are canned, uh, essentially canned cocktails, uh, or, or these, these whiskey highballs. And because they're affordable and they're, they're approachable, they're very easy drinking. Um, so, you know, we now have suddenly canned cocktails were everywhere in the U.S. this summer. People love it. It's really refreshing on the beach in the summertime. Yeah. What's a, how long have you been working on this, by the way? I just had a curiosity. I think it was about an 18-month process from okay. the time that we... From the time Tuttle said, okay, maybe pitch us a Japan drinks guide 
to final proofs, I think it was about 18 months, mm -hmm. uh, which I, it didn't, it, it flew by. I mean, yeah. it really, it happened fast. The writing was finished much sooner, actually. It was the, the, the photography and then the editing yeah. after we're going through that process, which was, yeah. again, it was a great experience. And I feel like the book, like I never could have imagined how they laid it out. Yeah. Like taking the, the, the Word documents I sent them and the yeah. probably 12,000 photos I sent them, that yeah. this is what they turned it into. I just, it was a really, really interesting process, and I'm very, very satisfied with yeah. the result. Very cool. No, it's beautiful. That's it. That's very exciting. It originally, it was going to be, it was supposed to be a soft cover, okay. and it was supposed to be square. Huh. And I, I would just, I had a hard time wrapping my head around that. And so then when I saw the, the proofs, I was like, that's not square. Yeah. And then... And then they told me it was going to be hardcover, and I was surprised and, yeah. and pleased. Yeah. It's also a heavier book now, so when yeah, I'm yeah. carrying them around. When you have to go on book tours and, <laughs> right. and lug books around, it's, yeah. it means an extra suitcase. But. That's right. <laughs> and I'm, so I, I'm getting in the habit of direct ordering books to the shops rather yeah. than you know, carrying them around. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's quite exciting, and I, I, I think it's really affordable. When yeah, friends of mine... Absolutely. Absolutely. What's, and U.S. What, it's, it's, well, it's, I mean, it's a twenty dollars book or something, right? Yeah, it's nineteen ninety nine on Amazon right, right now. And I yeah. think when I when my friends saw it, because it's an international, it doesn't have pricing in the in the leaf mm -hmm. because it's an it's designed for yeah. worldwide uh, distribution. But when I told them, they were like, "This is a forty dollars book, right?" And I was like, "No, it's half that." And to me, it's a, a value. It was at one point. It was, I don't know why, but on Amazon they were selling it for like fourteen dollars. They had like a special. Well, that's what price I early I swear on. I looked on that was like eleven ninety nine or something like that. When I looked on, it, I was like, "This what? Yeah. That's that's that doesn't make any sense." Right, right. I couldn't I couldn't figure out how. Even at twenty dollars, I think it's a. It's, it's a no, it's absolutely, a steal, absolutely, sure. absolutely. No, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. Very good. In Japan, it costs a little more. Yeah, which, as as is common. That's, that's right. That's, apparently, apparently, part of the I asked them why, and they said it's uh, warehousing costs oh. are higher here. And I guess it could, it, I mean, from a real estate perspective, it doesn't really make sense because I think, it, you know, renting or leasing property is actually cheaper here than in, at least in, the, I mean, I'm thinking yeah, I guess, prices. Yeah, I guess it depends where you're leasing the property yeah. maybe. But, but then, you know, people here are paid a living wage, so that could be, yeah. Yeah. Could be part that. of, part of why it uh, costs a little There's bit that. more. That. But it's, you know, $2 more or something. Yeah, it's not, yeah. Not Absolutely. A big deal. Yeah. Nice. Nothing prohibit. Not nothing too prohibitive. That's if right. You're, if you're already going out for for drinks in the evening, anyway, it's not a <laughs> yeah. It's, and hopefully, you'll, huge... you know, you'll find some interesting drinks you want to try and learn something in the process. Yeah. Excellent. Um, being a podcast called Sake on Air, we got to talk about sake a little bit here. Um, sake. You kick off the book with sake. That's right. That's right. Um, and you mentioned that you know this was kind of your first real in-depth foray into the world of sake what about when you dug in there and started researching or what sort of research did you do aside from like you said getting your kiki sake she see your kiki sake she um licensure what did you visit breweries or going to bars what was i did was I, I, visit, like? I visited uh uh dasai in yamaguchi and but probably my most important visit was um I visited the makers of Kaze no Mori in, uh, in Nara. Yeah, yeah. And I expected it to be like virtually every other sake brewery or, or shochu distillery visit I'd ever done. You get the tour, you get a tasting, you talk for a few minutes, and you're done. We spent two hours in his living room, and he broke down the history of Nara's sake for me, like with hand-drawn timelines and maps and he brought out pictures and source materials and like I got such a deep education on the history of Nara sake that I've that really to me is probably the biggest contribution that I've made to the sake literature with the information that he shared with me that the Toji shared with me yeah. in uh, you know in the book yeah. and most of it's a rehash of things I read from John Gauntner and yeah. uh, Philip Harper and yeah. you know other other sake experts so it was really that conversation where apparently there's now evidence that they were clarifying sake during the Nara period, which just sort of shocked everyone. Yeah. So it was actually very close to what we're drinking today, much earlier than, than we expected, which yeah. I found fascinating. Yeah. I actually had a very similar experience down there, and I think he, he tends to um, convert a lot of people into 
after you've heard the spiel and been through that, uh, you kind of rediscover Nara in a completely different, in the relationship in the world of sake in kind of an entirely different light. So there's some really important stuff going on down there that has been going on down there. Absolutely. For a long time. It's very exciting. Yeah, very good. Um, Shochu, Japan's best kept secret. Yeah, I stole that title from Christopher Pellegrini. <laughs> Did, does he know? He'll, he'll find out once he, once he gets the book. I don't think he, he hasn't. Well, he read the Shochu chapter, and yeah. if it had that title at the time, he, he was my my proofreader, I guess, and yeah. made sure I didn't screw things up. <laughs> um, yeah, so Shochu is really, that was my gateway into Japanese alcohol. I was complete, I was, you know, I enjoyed sushi, ramen, whatever, and early on in my life in New York, I started visiting izakaya, but I didn't know what they were. Yeah. They were just Japanese, you know, casual Japanese restaurants. And it was only when I discovered shochu that I started down this path. Uh, and I really just fell in love with this idea of a low-proof spirit that had a lot of interesting flavor. And, you know, once I started to visit the makers and learn the history and everything, I just, I went deep. Yeah. Uh, and I've stayed there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, it, for me, it was, a, it was a nice opportunity to express a lot of that and, and to get down a lot of my thoughts mm-hmm. about shochu on the page. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, it's not a full book like Christopher's, you know, I, I feel like, um, a lot of my own ideas are now out there, you know, yeah. people can in, in print. That's right. That's yeah. right. And then it, the same, you know, the Awamori chapter actually, which is the, the, the next chapter, uh, that was important for me because Christopher only touches on Awamori a little bit in his, in his Shochu handbook. Uh, so to my knowledge, this is probably the most extensive writing on Awamori in English, which I, I think is important. And Awamori is a, it's a rice-based distillate. It's actually made, the, the fermentation process is actually very similar to sake, but it's using long grain, usually using long grain rice. And then it's u- exclusively made using black koji, which most sake is using yellow koji. And so it has a very, very different flavor profile. And of course it's distilled and then most often aged in clay pots. Mm. And so it's a, it's a very rich, earthy, rustic drink. Yeah. Uh, and yet, even with those parameters, it's made from essentially a single ingredient, single production style, you know, it's all distilled and then most of it's aged in clay. It still has a very wide spe- spectrum of expressions, which is fascinating yeah. to me. Yeah. And that's what I was actually going to ask you. Because I mean, we're as guilty of this as anyone here on the show as well. We have a show about sake and shochu that only has the word sake in the title. Uh, at the beginning of every show, we say we do a, a show about sake and shochu, but we lump awamori in there. That's right. The It's, you know, uh, we just, can't, it's just, too much of a mouthful is pretty much the only reason we don't, you know, announce it every single time. But we lump that right into the category of shochu, uh, which is actually not necessarily in line with how we maybe should be communicating. Are we ready to speak about awamori on its own terms? Can it stand on its own? I think it could, yeah. but I think it would, in doing so, it might end up actually getting relegated into one of the sort of afterthought categories. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, there's a lot of other like Southeast Asian spirits, which are actually very similar to Awamori that nobody even knows yeah. the name or how to pronounce, yeah. you know. I'm going to say Lao Kao, and I'm probably mispronouncing that yeah. from, from Thailand, yeah. uh, which I think was in, in a sim- it was made in a similar fashion, and that we, we believe that's where the, the, the distilling technology came to Okinawa through trade with Thailand. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure. It's a good question. I mean... Japanese government regulations sort of put lump them together. They do identify them as distinct, and they do have their own rules and regulations. Um, but there are only forty-seven distilleries. They're all in Okinawa. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. It's a, it's an interesting question. The, yeah. I, the reason I separated in the book is because the production methods are different from shochu. If you were to make an awamori, sorry, if you were to make awamori using shochu production methods. It would be shochu. It would be a black koji yeah. rice, long grain rice yeah. shochu, and I've I've actually tasted those. I've I've tried those in Kyushu, where people have made a black koji, Thai rice, yeah. uh, you know, sh- uh, shochu. You know, so yeah. they've done a first fermentation, a second fermentation, and then distillation. Where awamori is made much more in the sake style, where you have an all koji fermentation, and then uh, you'll add additional rice, like the sandan shikomi. Mm like you do in sake production. A lot of the awamori makers will do the same thing. And it's a much longer fermentation. It's about, I think, usually uh, four, to, four to five weeks uh, of fermentation where shochu is usually finished in about three or less. Um, so it, it, to me, it is, a different, it is a different drink. And yet it's hard to separate them 
Yeah. Um, so I don't know if it did stand on its own. Yeah. Yeah, but that's, it's that's yeah. I I don't know what the answer is either. That's something that I've just been kind of pondering a lot lately. And that it's when you, when you really dig back in, where when you when you're talking about you know getting back to those traditional beverages and things like that, shochu, there's all kinds of stuff all over the place. But if you want to dig back into the roots, you get you you end up at awamori, right? Sure, sure. Well, and and this I guess is something that I, you know, I don't I don't think I dig into it too much in the book, but it only became a rice based beverage after the war. As far as I understand, anything prior to then, they could make it really from anything. They were, when they were making awamori in old Yukyu, so uh, Okinawa was an independent country for most of world yeah. history, yeah. and it only very recently became part of Japan. Yeah. And from that perspective, it is a different drink. It is yeah. a different tradition because they were separate countries. But uh, as I understand, they used to make awamori out of sugarcane mm-hmm. and out of sweet potatoes, out of whatever they could find to, to ferment and distill. Yeah. The only catch was that for most of Awamori's history, it could only be made as a drink for the royal family. Yeah. It was not available to the common people. And so it was really an aristocratic beverage. Mm. And so all of it was being produced traditionally within sight of the castle walls in Okinawa. And so because it, uh, making Awamori illegally was actually punishable by death. Mm in Okinawa. And Okinawa's got, what, 400 islands? Like, yeah. I'm sure there was yeah. plenty of illegal, yeah. you know, brewing and distillation going on, but uh, the sanctioned distilleries were all in one district mm-hmm. in the, I believe it's called the Sanka district, uh, outside of the castle walls. Mm-hmm. And during the Battle of Okinawa, mm-hmm. all of those distilleries were destroyed by the American yeah. gunships. And it was actually believed for several years that Black Koji was gone. Was maybe gone as well, yeah. Uh, and they finally found some black koji growing on a straw mat in the rubble, and they were able to revive mm. the Okinawan black koji from that. Mm. Uh, so from that perspective, I think it's a very different yeah. tradition than, yeah. than shochu. But you could say the same thing about shochu. If you go to the prehistory of shochu before the really good documentation of what it was doing, it was farm distillation. Yeah. It was farmers who were taking their excess crops and turning it into booze. Yeah. And so it was moonshine. Right. And it, now it wasn't for the royal family yeah. in, in Kyushu or around the rest of Japan. It was actually a, a drink for the peasants. And so um, there were no rules to how you made it. Yeah. Right. People made it with koji because that's how you could get grains to ferment yeah. in Japan because they didn't know how to malt yeah. barley. Yeah. Right. That came later. Yeah. So um, very, very different traditions. And so. I do think they should. They deserve to be separate drinks. I guess I'm contradicting myself, but the yeah. more we talk about it, <laughs> yeah, it's it's it's. it's I I, I kind of always go back and forth when just with myself when I think about this stuff. It's just, they they lend so much to one another, and when it comes to, from a communication standpoint, you can you you have so much more to leverage if you can use both. But then at the same time, if you talk about them independently, then they feel very powerful in and of their own right and so it's it's it's, it's tough <laughs> yeah i guess when you're introducing it you know to, to to novices i think maybe combining them makes sense yeah but i think once people start to dig deeper it there should it should be very clear that they're separate yeah yeah, was, yeah was there were there it, it, shochu and awamori those are i guess you could say kind of in your wheelhouse um they are digging in and doing the research what were were there any interesting discoveries you said you kind of had you're happy to have the chance to sort of lend a few of your own words to the to the dialogue around around these what was yeah well i I mean i've spent most of my time in shochu distilleries actually every fall i go and work in a distillery and i so i I feel like i know shochu as well as i know almost anything in my life so that was very easy for me you know i I almost i what i worried about was being too complacent and not going back and doing research and double checking and that sort of thing Uh, and that's why i had christopher uh, pellegrini give it a good read Um, but with awamori i've only been to okinawa once and it was my first trip to Kyushu and, and Okinawa, and I haven't been back. And so what doing research for that chapter actually allowed me to do was open up lines of communication to some of the distilleries I'd visited previously and getting updates from them and reminding them that I'm still interested in their drinks. And uh, so that was, I think, what I really enjoyed about that. And I guess it's a, it applies broadly to the, to the book, but um, I studied history in college. I'm now a university professor doing research and and I also have a interest in storytelling and so the book really gave me an opportunity to combine those interests there's a lot of history in the book but not so much you're going to be bored I hope there's a lot of really interesting stories about people and places and things that happen and then it I think it's organized very logically like a 
like a scientist would write a, a scientific manuscript because that's how I've written my entire career. Mm. And this is my first time writing something that isn't about yeah. <laughs> medicine, yeah, you know. Yeah. So uh, from that perspective, I I think it's sort of I think that's you know people talk about your voice in writing, and I think my voice might be reflected in how I've written and organized the book yeah. as much as how I've written things. Uh, but so that the, for the for the Okinawan section of the book, the Awamori section, so much of the, what's fascinating is that history, mm. because the Satsuma domain invaded Okinawa, mm. you know, uh, with the blessing of the shogun, mm. and you know all of the history and the political intrigue and everything that happened mm. around that time and how the drink was only allowed to be made for the royal family and their and their favorite yeah. subjects. All of that just was fascinating to me yeah. in digging into that chapter. Yeah. I'm really hoping to get get down there this winter, yeah, yeah, for another visit and visit some uh, some some other distilleries as well as some of the ones that I'd visited before. Yeah. What's interesting about those distilleries is they actually do remind me more of what you would expect from Mezcal, I think, because you'll mm. find distilleries with dirt floors. Yeah. And like aluminum siding, you know, buildings that would blow over in a in a strong yeah. wind. Yeah. Um you know, rotting roof beams and, you know, it's it's much more rustic than yeah. I think you'd find in, in Kyushu for most of the shochu distilleries. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I was actually, while well, I was in New York, I was at a barbecue and I ended up s- me- talking to this beer brewer. He's, he's He works at one of the breweries in, in New York and we were just swapping videos of fermentations that we'd seen, yeah. like on our yeah, phones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he showed me a mezcal fermentation, which was this open vat mm sitting out in a field yeah with all the elements over and it's yeah. just bubbling away yeah. and it, it was just wild yeah and that's kind of how i feel like a lot of the okinawan yeah awamori distilleries are they're doing open tank fermentations yeah. usually the windows are left open so you've got all the yeah. the house yeasts and natural yeah. yeasts and things yeah uh so it's a maybe mezcal isn't a bad yeah. comparison to, yeah, to it's kind of a little bit hyper localized there and kind of yeah yeah we'll see we'll see we'll see interesting yeah interesting interesting yeah. So, so the next chapter was Umeshu, which I admit yes. to not knowing anything about when I started. And I actually originally wrote the chapter as Kajitsu Shu, okay. which would be fruit yep. liquors. Fruit liquors. Or, yeah. Liqueurs. And, and, you know, pe- we say plum wine in the States yeah. or in overseas, but actually it's not a wine yeah. because the, the plums don't actually add any. They're not fermented and they yeah. don't add any uh, alcohol. There's no, it, they're actually there for flavoring. There's no fruit fermentation or anything. That's right. There, so yeah. it's really a liqueur. Yeah. And so and the Japanese have all sorts of delicious fruit liqueurs. You know, there's peach and you know, yuzu and and all these different things. And I do touch on that in the in the chapter. And I also touch on yakushu, mm. which is the the herb ferments which are basically like they remind me a lot of the European digestives. Yeah. Uh which just have like these almost medicinal qualities and and that sort of thing. But I really knew virtually nothing about like how is umeshu made yeah. or where is it made, yeah. or anything like that? And yeah. so that was a lot of uh, research. Yeah, uh, I bet to to I figure bet. out. And fortunately, I I was able to meet a couple of the Umeshu makers, and then uh, Nancy Hachitsu oh. was it, uh, kind enough to to give me a, a home brew recipe, so you can make yeah. Umeshu at home, which is actually the only home brewing you're allowed to do in Japan. And actually, this is one thing that we need to just dial in and do a whole episode on is umeshu or, you know, yuzushu and these things like that, because it's super prevalent. But it again, it's another one that sort of sits in sort of this uncategory almost because it's not. It's technically a liqueur, but it doesn't necessarily satisfy what people would expect from something in that category a lot of times now sake producers are making them from sake and fantastic sake and fantastic local you know um, ume or yuzu or other fruits and things and they're just incredibly high quality delicious delicious um interpretations of that product that are out there but it's still i think for the context for a lot of people it's like you said it's that homebrew that somebody made from a cheap white liquor and some, you know, real cheap sugar and, you know, whatever, you know, a bag of plums from the, from the supermarket. It's just been sitting at home underneath the kitchen sink for the last like 12 years because nobody drinks it. Nobody knows what to do with it. Or it's sort of used as the gateway drug for people who are, when they're trying to pitch sake, um, but it just doesn't quite hit home. It's like here, here, give this, give this guy a try. It's only like 
eight percent alcohol and it's really really sweet and whether they fall in love with it or not nobody complains because it's because it's lovely it's tasty um but it's <clears throat> there are a lot of producers that do actually invest a lot of time and energy into making a really really great product but you just don't hear about it a whole lot what was what was sort of your right. discovery process <clears throat> like and so umeshu is the last of the chapters about traditional Japanese alcohols. And the reason I positioned it there is because it of all of the, between sake, shochu, awamori, and umeshu, it's the last one that has written documentation of its existence. Mm. It actually wasn't, the, the, the term does not appear in Japanese writing uh, until the 17th century. Uh, I'm sure that they were making it far earlier than that, but if it really was a homebrew, then it wasn't something that would be on the tax collector's radar. Yeah, and right? that's and that's what it pops up in. That's where like the actual you found records on. Is it something that's related to? I don't believe that's where the first mention okay. is. But the first mention wasn't until I believe something like 1697. Yeah. Like it was very very late the first yeah. time Umishu appears. Yeah. Um, but the other alcohol traditions like sake, the first writings about sake come from uh, what was it a. a Chinese emissary, you know, it was like a gov- official government document. Mm. And the first writing about Awamori in Okinawa was actually a Korean emissary's uh, writings. Mm-hmm. First mention of shochu was graffiti <laughs> <laughs> in a shrine. Uh, but, you know, the first mention of umeshu came much, much later. And I suspect it's because it was a home brew. It was basically somebody with secondary aging yeah. sake or shochu with plums in it. Yeah. And nobody really thought of it as an official alcohol category. Yeah. So it was much later, the, the, you know, the first mention. Yeah. But the ume was introduced. The, the, the plum was introduced from China as a, as a herbal medicine about a thousand years earlier. Mm. And, and it's still touted for its medicinal properties and things like that. Here that's in right. In a lot of different contexts. Yeah. That's right. The, the, when you make an ume boshi, so the, the ume plum is very high in citric acid. And so uh, it's considered re- rejuvenating and, and healthy and uh, it's, it's a very when, when you make the the pickled ume the, the dried plums they're they're very lightweight and easy to carry and so the samurai actually used to carry them with them mm. when they were on the move you know going to battle or that sort of thing because it was an efficient food source efficient energy source mm. it actually the citric acid i believe if i get the, have this right it's it's correct in the book i'm not sure if i remember it correctly <laughs> the it actually helps break down lactic acid which your body builds up during exercise mm. so if you, you can imagine if you're in battle and you're working really hard and all that heavy armor and swinging yeah. around your sword or your spear or your shooting arrows or whatever, you'd tire out and and you'd have lactic acid building up in your muscles, which is where the soreness comes from. Yeah. And eating the ume boshi, the pickled plum, actually would help break down that lactic acid yeah. and rejuvenate. Yeah, yeah. So like, there's a reason yeah. why it's medicinal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and you see, it's, it's now it's often associated with like something that farmers will snack on during their lunch break and things like that. And so it's, yeah, it's definitely tied into that, um, let's say, hard, hard labor. Right. <laughs> it's, it's utility in the, world of, in the world of hard labor. Right, know? right. And, uh, but an interesting thing that happened was you know, there was an umeshu boom a few years ago where they started having a lot of export to Southeast Asia, China, Korea, um, because it was being purported health benefits to umeshu, especially young women uh, were drinking it. But what the government realized is ume production, like the annual harvest had not increased, and the consumption of ume boshi had stayed flat, but the production of umeshu had skyrocketed. So how could you make the same amount of umeshu, mm. or make more umeshu from the same number of plums? Yeah, and they discovered that a lot of the companies had switched to, to chemical processes that mm. mimic the flavor of ume without using any actual plums. Yeah, okay. Um, wow. And so the government got wise to it, and they said, "Wait a minute, it's not really umeshu if you're not putting any ume in it, mm. right? It's basically haposhu or mm. a chuhai." Yeah. Right, this is essentially yeah. what they were making, yeah. and sparkling umeshu was huge. Yeah, and then sparkling umeshu has now virtually disappeared mm. from the market because it's all been converted into chuhais. Mm. Right, so now yeah, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. it's plum flavored chuhais yeah. rather than yeah c- being labeled and sold as umeshu. Yeah, um, and then what they've done is I think very wisely the umeshu industry has come up with a honkaku designation. Yeah. So just like for Honkaku Shochu or Honkaku Awamori, they need to be made in an authentic way, in a yeah. traditional way, yeah. in order to get that designation. Yeah. 
And so Honkaku Umeshu is now Umeshu made only from yeah. alcohol, whatever alcohol source you want to use, uh, rock sugar and, and plums. So yeah. you can't add any art- artificial flavorings yeah. or colorings. Yeah. Uh, so Honkaku Umeshu is, I think, very much in the category of what you're talking about yeah. now with these very lovely expressions that yeah. sake brewers and whiskey makers are, yeah. are creating. <coughs> and they really are. You, you're getting these very high-end products. You're getting barrel-aged Umeshu, you know, which are almost coming out like brandies. Mm-hmm. There's just a lot of really, really interesting styles. Uh, I think it's e- Eigashima Shuzo. Mm. Uh, which is one of the early whiskey makers is now doing an umeshu using their whiskey base and it tastes like a old fashioned in a bottle like yes. it's just really really interesting yes. drink yes. uh the awamori makers are getting into it so you get this rich deep umami you know with the black koji and the and the fatty acids from the thai rice mm-hmm. and you're throwing plums in that uh you've got uh is it um what's the sake brewery nanbu bijin yeah. now has a no sugar umeshu mm-hmm. Yeah, which makes sense because there's residual sugars in the sake, Already so you don't anyway. need to add any. Yep, um, yeah. that's lovely. Like you've just got really, really interesting styles coming out. And as I said earlier, even though umeshu is predominant in the category, there's also all the other fruits. Yeah, that are being used to make yeah. alcohol, and those are also really, really interesting. Yeah. I I personally like peaches, and so the momoshu yeah, yeah. is great. Yeah, and um, yeah. I can't drink banana shoe because i'm allergic to bananas <laughs> yeah. but, um, somebody else might enjoy that yeah uh, but there's lots of different styles that are that are really interesting yeah excellent so have you seen these and so what is this add your own sake to make a sake sangria in a cup and they just sell you essentially the one cup with the glass with different mixes of fruit and sweeteners and things like that and you add it and one thing they're looking at is the international market as opposed to getting sake and selling sake overseas they're <laughs> looking to do these pre-made cups with these different things aren't that's a really interesting i thought idea. that was kind of interesting i have yet to try it i have a i have a couple samples sitting on my shelf at home i haven't i haven't dipped in yet but yeah, it's a fun concept yeah that that reminds me um in the so the wine chapter i'm, yeah. I'm jumping ahead yeah. now, but in the wine chapter the first great japanese winemaker didn't make wine in japan mm. he made wine in california mm. He was part of the Satsuma students who left Japan illegally, uh, and they were sent to England to study. And these, most of these men, they were all children of samurai, mm-hmm. but, uh, considered the bite- brightest and best of the mm-hmm. Satsuma domain. And I believe 15 students went uh, to England to study. 14 of them came back. The one who stayed actually ended up first in New York State, where he was the first Asian student at Cornell University. Mm. And he then ended up joining a commune in Western New York where he learned winemaking. Huh. And then he and the commune leader uh, decided they could probably do better making wine in California. So they moved the commune to Santa Rosa, California, huh. where over the next probably 30 or 40 years, it became the largest wine producer in California. They were the first winery to export wine to France from the U.S. That is wild. And he, wow. he only came back to Japan uh, for trade reasons. He yeah. never actually moved back to Japan. He died in California. Um, but, it, but, and he kept his adopted name. All of the students who went over took assumed names so that they, if they were caught by Jap- the Japanese government living overseas, yeah. their families would be protected because they'd yeah. have names that weren't their real names. Yeah. All, all of them, when they came back to Japan, after Japan opened up in the Meiji Restoration, yeah these all became titans of industry and government and they really helped lead the Meiji restoration because they went over and learned engineering and science and math and everything. Uh, And Nagasawa Kanai Mm -hmm. kept his assumed name and lived Mm -hmm. in California. Uh, But he actually got hit hard by prohibition. Mm -hmm. And so during prohibition, he switched to making grape juice. But a little bit like your... Mm. Your uh, example here. Your example here. He would actually had a label on his his cans of grape juice or bottles of grape juice that said, "To make sure this doesn't turn into wine, don't do this." Yeah, <laughs> right. which is essentially saying, <laughs> "Be sure to do this." That's right. right. This is how you can turn this into <laughs> yeah. wine. You, you can yeah. still have your wine and own. Yeah. And apparently, he was still like he he threw lavish parties all throughout yeah. Prohibition, and people like Jack London was apparently a regular yeah. guest at his house. <laughs> to to go and, and drink his wine and enjoy his food and that sort of thing so 
that was a fascinating story to research yeah. as well in that chapter. Oh, very cool. Uh, and then it was only later that wine started to be produced in Japan. Yeah. Uh, but he was arguably the most famous winemaker around the turn of the century in California. Oh, and he was a wild. Japanese, he was a samurai, yeah. essentially. That's wild. That's very cool. Yeah, that's very cool. And looking at wine, did you go around, did you go to some different areas and visit some different wineries and things? I did. I visited wineries uh, both in Kyushu and in uh, Yamanashi. Mm. And I really found it interesting. I had a pretty dim view of Japanese wine when I started the research for the book. But I found especially... Uh, the Japanese now are working a lot with Yamabudo or mountain grapes, and then they're creating hybrids with uh, the mountain native Japanese mountain grapes and other grapes. And you end up with these aromas and, and flavor profiles that they're completely foreign. Yeah, they they don't match any of our expectations from a Cabernet or a Pinot yeah. or anything like that. But when you accept it on its own terms, it actually becomes very very interesting. Yeah. Um, and so the most famous Japanese wine grape right now is the Koshu, which yeah. is white grape that's actually been winning awards overseas. Mm. Uh, but I find that the Yamabudo expressions fascinating. I really, really enjoy them. Um, but I think it's going to take time before Japan becomes considered like a very strong wine making region. Yeah. Uh, partly, I think, because a lot of the vineyards are relatively new. Mm. So the young vines don't produce as, mm -hmm. as nice of wines mm -hmm. as older mm -hmm. vines um but you know there have been grapes in yamanashi for four five hundred years yeah, so right. i'm sure there's some old vines yeah somewhere. They're, they're, they're floating around there somewhere right yeah, that's right. absolutely no that's that's super exciting that's i, I like the position it that way so you start taking it on its own terms so it's, right we're, yeah. we're in japan no, no reason to make the try and make the same stuff they're making in piedmont or anything like that right that's I mean, right it's it's that's kind of i think that's kind of what makes it exciting it'll be a lot of fun it does one of the most interesting wineries actually is down in miyazaki mm. uh, it's a sumo winery huh. miyazaki actually made the first believed to be the first shiraz and the first sparkling shiraz in japan uh the the winemaker had yeah. gone and, and trained in in australia yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and so when he came back he decided to make that style and it, it's delicious oh. if you can find it <laughs> if you can find it it's yeah. a very small producer yeah but, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So there, what is, I, mean, you, I said it's kind of outside the scope of the show normally, but there are wine producers popping up all over the place in prefectures and areas that you would have never e even guessed or would have imagined there being grapes growing there. It's 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 a really really rapidly developing um, industry, and it's 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 really exciting. It's, it's, there's a lot of exciting stuff that you're not going to find out there in different pro profiles that don't that don't exist anywhere else, like you said. That's right. Yeah, and like Hokkaido is now the largest wine-producing region in Japan. Yeah. And, you know, traditionally it was Yamanashi, which is, you know, mm. near Mount Fuji and, you know, has nice climate for growing grapes as well. But now suddenly Hokkaido is booming with wineries. I'm going to have to start another podcast. <laughs> Japanese wine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we'll, let's see. We'll, ju we'll jump here again. We'll jump here again. I'm going to jump ahead and let's... Can we touch on cocktails? Sure. Briefly. Um, why in the heck is Japan at the top of the cocktail world these days? You know, it's, it's I think, a combination of... Part of it, I think, you know, the Japanese attention to detail, I think, has a, a lot to do with it. Um, and I make the point in the book that, you know, if you were to ask a, a professional bartender most anywhere in the world where where is the best where are the best bartenders where are the best cocktails being made the answer if they know what they're talking about should be ginza it's not london it's not new york it's not paris it's not hong kong it's not even tokyo it's ginza it's one neighborhood yeah. one neighborhood in tokyo which has a huge number of bars and the cocktail preparation is so elegant and so precise and and they've really professionalized to the point where you might have eight bartenders working in a bar, you know, in a larger cocktail bar in Ginza. There might be eight guys working every night and gals, mm. and every single one of them will make the drink you order the same way. Mm. And so cocktails are not easy to make. Yeah. And if you can get eight people to all make uh, a, of course, I'm blanking on a cocktail name, like a Manhattan the yeah. same way. Yeah. And they all, all eight of them will taste the same. That's remarkable. Yeah, you would never get that in an American bar. Yeah. Even some of the top bars in, 
you know, in New York, which I visited, cocktail bars, you know, the drinks will vary, mm. you know, from bartender to bartender, even night from night, mm. night to night with the same bartender. Um, so I think that professionalism, you know, that level of, of attention to detail mm. really helped elevate bartending in Japan. Mm. And then you couple that with what happened with a number of Japanese who left and went and learned bartending overseas. Mm. So somebody like Shingo Gokan, yeah. who is a master bartender, and he's now world famous, and he's now trained this new generation of Japanese bartenders, and they're all winning international cocktail competitions mm -hmm. with really creative styles. Mm -hmm. And they might still have that same attention to detail and the same, same precision of movement that you would get in a Ginza bar where you have a white tuxedo guy who would yeah. never deviate from how you make a Manhattan yeah. to somebody like Shingo who's doing just really, really creative things with ingredients you'd never expect to find in a cocktail. Mm -hmm. And you take those two elements and you put them together and you just have this elevation of cocktails mm -hmm. beyond, almost beyond a craft, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's just remarkable. Yeah, absolutely. In looking at cocktails, does sake, Nihonshu in the cocktail ever come up when you were out there looking at it? Is that something you ever, did you dig into it all in the book? So I got cocktail recipes from Kenta Goto. Okay. So so there's now a bar in New York called Bar Goto. Mm -hmm. But Kenta Goto was a salary man who moved to New York. He was transferred to New York from, from Japan. And he started making cocktails at home. And then he got a part-time job. He, got, he was working one night a week at, as a bar back at Pegu Club. Mm -hmm. And Pegu Club was one of the first big cocktail palaces in New York when cocktails started their revival. And within I think three or four or five years he ended up the head bartender at Pegu Club mm -hmm. and he won like best bartender in America from Tales of the Cocktail and mm -hmm. I might have that fact wrong but he basically was recognized yeah, was, as one of the top yeah. bartenders in, in the country and he then ended up opening his own place mm -hmm. uh, which is Bar Goto and he actually contributed cocktails and I asked him for cocktails mm -hmm. using Asian yeah. or uh, sorry Japanese uh, alcohols and he so he gave I think both sake and shochu mm -hmm. focus cocktails for the book. Yeah. So you can make them at home, yeah. although they probably won't come out as beautifully as when yeah. he makes them. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think, you know, sake is an interesting complement in a cocktail. I'm mm -hmm. not sure that, you know, you, temp you tend to need something with a little bit more heft. Right. Uh, but I think sake can be a really nice uh, addition. No, I was just sort of curious sort of what you found in your, in your exploration there, because it's, it's very divisive. It's a, a lot of brewers or people on the education side will, you know, will say this is not what this is for. You know, you wouldn't you wouldn't pour my um, you wouldn't pour my Pinot into your whatever you know, same sort of a concept. Um, while at the same time, you have a lot of other places that are saying, hey, if it if it works and you want to do it, go for it. Sure. Um, and it's but when you talk to a lot of bartenders on a very fundamental level, they basically tell you, yeah, you might be able to use it, but it's not on a very basic level of what you need to create a cocktail. It's, that's not, we, that's not it. Um, and so a lot of places struggle to do it. Whereas a lot of places do it because it's interesting. It's exotic. It's something, it's something new. Um, and so it's just, it's this interesting part of the conversation that's sort of always there. Um, but when you talk to brewers or people who are doing that, they never bring up the idea of sake cocktails and things. But it's still something that is very much within sort of the zeitgeist and people are talking about it and doing it. So it just kind of sits in this very peculiar space right now, I feel like, in, in sort of the conversation. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, you know, especially when you're making premium sake, mm -hmm. you know, you've spent so much time and effort and blood and sweat and tears in, in making the product to have it go into a, a mixer just seems almost sacrilegious. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, especially in America, there's this sense that if you want your your category of alcohol or your style of alcohol to break out, it needs to end up in a cocktail. Yeah. You know, tequila didn't become a thing until you know uh, until it ended up in a margarita. Yeah. And you know, there's so, there's there was this sense that sort of you know tequila was like an overnight sensation. Some people talk yeah. about like tequila just sort of happened, but. but they, Mexico and Mexican tequila makers have been investing in the U.S. for 50 years yeah. in trying to make it a thing. And then finally, when it took off, it went. Yeah. But uh, if it wasn't for the margarita, I don't think tequila would still be a thing. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And so I think it's just if you want your product to 
sort of blow up in America, then cocktails are, are one of the one of the avenues you need. And I had a really interesting experience a few years ago when a shochu maker came to New York. It was a it was a contingent of shochu makers, and uh, and then they had bartenders making cocktails from all the different shochu that was brought over. And this one shochu maker, you know, tried the cocktail and was like, was really upset. And that, but, and I think might have even left, like didn't even stick around for the event. And then that was the first cocktail that they ran out of because it was the most popular. Huh. Right. And yeah. so, of course, you know, you're making a, a premium shochu. You want people to enjoy it as it is. But if people aren't ready for that, then let cocktails be the gateway. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't drink shochu cocktails. Yeah. <laughs> unless yeah. someone forces it on me. If I'm curious yeah. about it. Yeah. Uh, if I see one on a menu in a bar I've never been to, sure. Wow, yeah. they've got shochu in a cocktail. See what see what they're up to. See what they're doing. Yeah. Usually it's not interesting to me because it masks the flavor. And I want to yeah. taste the shochu. Yeah. Um, but if it gets people to try shochu mm-hmm. or yeah. sake. Yeah. Great. Yeah. 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 You know, that's my my feeling. Yeah, absolutely. 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 Very cool. One of the things that sort of defines the traditional Japanese alcoholic beverages from the stuff that was brought in from overseas is going to be koji. Are you seeing, did you find anything, say, like the use of koji transitioning into any other beverages or anything like that? Or is that line starting to blur at all? It, it is starting to. Yeah. Uh, there was a collaboration between an Italian beer maker and a Japanese, I believe, Kikuchi. Mm. Is it Kik- Who makes Hitachino Nest? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, up, up north, up there, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Hitachino Nest collaborated with an Italian brewer, and this Italian brewer made black koji and yellow koji beers. Okay. And the black koji was this, this sour, you know, punch in the mouth, and the yellow koji was like this honeyed, elegant drink and so you know you're starting to see a little bit of koji being used in beer production uh and another you know interesting thing that i discovered as i was doing research for the whiskey chapter is again like the first japanese winemaker was making wine in california Mm. the first japanese to make whiskey you could argue did it in peoria illinois Hmm. uh there was a japanese chemist i actually only learned this because i found somebody's dissertation (laughs) <laughs> about this guy <laughs> wow. on online. Uh, he was a Japanese chemist who actually first made his money in phosphate. Hmm. And then he fell in love with an American when he was uh, in the States on a on an, a mission with the ambassador mm-hmm. and ended up, he actually fell in love with her first and he went back to Japan to make his fortune in phosphate and then came back to marry her. And then while he was, then she moved with him back to Japan. It's a, it's a convoluted story, but yeah. it's, I think it's interesting. Yeah. Um, they end up having kids in Japan, and then he patents a, a stomach ailment remedy mm. in Japan that actually is using koji as a, as a digestive aid, okay. which in a weird way makes sense. Yeah. So he makes a second fortune on that. They move back to the States, and his mother-in-law introduces him to the president of the Illinois Whiskey Trust, in which he then develops and patents a malt, maltless whiskey process, which was koji. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, he yeah. was growing koji on cereal de barley. Yeah. And, um, and finally, he licensed the patent to the Illinois Whiskey Trust. And the maltsters union caught wind of it because of an article in the Chicago Tribune. And like a week later, the distillery was burned down. I've heard about this. I've heard, yeah, yeah. And then they rebuild the distillery and they start making this this whiskey, this maltless whiskey. Uh, and then six months later, the distillery goes into bankruptcy. And because it was a trust, this is right around the time of trust busting. Yeah. So once the government figured out that they could just crush the trust because of the bankruptcy, they just mm-hmm. shut the whole thing down. Yeah. And nobody knows what happened to those barrels. But for about six months, they were making this maltless whiskey, huh. which was essentially koji, yeah. bar, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was a barley yeah. koji spirit. Wow. It was shochu, yeah. <laughs> essentially. Yeah, essentially, yeah. And it was in barrels in Illinois. And who knows, it probably just got blended with other things for another distillery yeah, and when, the, when the stock got sold off. And, and nobody, you know, it's, it's kind of stillbirth, right? Yeah. Still, stillborn. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
but now I've actually, there was a, there's a craft distiller in, I want to say Scandinavia, who's doing a lot of koji. Um, there's a couple now yeah. shochu distilleries is, in there's, the U.S. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So koji is starting to become a thing. Yeah. Where it seems to be taking off even more in the U.S. is with, with food. In a lot of chefs are using it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. More for the, the proteases that, yeah. to break, you know, tenderize meats and that sort of thing. Yeah. So there's a Jeremy Umansky who, if you ever have a chance to have I, him on your he's, show, you he's should. on he's on my list. I got to make it out that way. Yeah. yeah, he he actually he's fast curing meats. He's making charcuterie in like yeah. days instead of months. Yeah, using koji. So yeah, it's, it looks, it's I, 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 I'm, I'm keeping an eye on him. He's, he's doing beautiful things over there. He is. He is. Um, yeah. So I do see you know a fair amount of koji popping up in in Western alcohols. You don't need it for wine. Yep. Wines, you know, wine is easy. You need yep. grapes and feet. Yeah to yep. make wine yep. so um you don't need koji to do anything to starches mm. but for you know beer it makes sense whiskey it makes sense other spirits you know tell me you're breaking grains into you yeah. know car- complex carbohydrates and yeah. you start into sugars it's yeah. it's useful yeah definitely, definitely. So, it's actually much more efficient than malting yeah uh so that's something i think a lot of people don't understand don't, yeah absolutely you're extracting a lot more sugar yep uh, per grain than you than you would get from malting yeah yeah, definitely, definitely. I know you went into you went into process with all of these a bit here as well too, and you know not just you know how how imp- in in order to get people just kind of in your experience excited about the beverage, how how important is it to communicate the process? You know, I th- I think part of the reason I did that is because so often when I was introducing shochu to people, you know, the first question was how is this different from sake. Right. And it's distillation. A lot of people don't even know what distillation is. Yeah. So I think if you're really going to become an educated consumer of these drinks, it's important to understand how they're made. Mm. You know, and and a lot of the beauty of I think especially sake, shochu and awamori is is these very unique production methods mm. and and those what decisions you make during those processes matter. They they count for everything. Mm. You know, that makes all the difference. Yeah. You know. You and I could take the exact same ingredients in the exact same distillery or brewery and make varied production decisions all the way through the process, yeah. and we'd come out with different drinks. Yeah. Um, and I personally, I find that fascinating. Maybe yeah. that's a scientist in me. Yeah. I want to understand the technical <laughs> details. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but hopefully, I've made it interesting for readers yeah. as well. Yeah, no, this is great. This is really great. Where's um, Something else I think we'd be remiss not to talk about yeah. since we're in Tokyo is yep. Hoppy. Yeah, let's do it. So, yeah, uh, it's a very yeah. It's it really does. Does something that does it exist anywhere else? I don't know of a drink like it. Yeah, uh, elsewhere. You want to explain just what hoppy is, real quick? Sure. Just, uh, so after after the war, uh, so Japanese beer has been heavily taxed for a long time. In fact, you could argue that the beer tax, you know, financed uh, Imperial Japan mm-hmm. and their aggression toward other countries and that sort of thing and lead up to the war. And so the beer tax remained high even after the war. And so people couldn't afford to drink it. You know, it was a, it was a luxurious beverage after the war when everyone was impoverished and that sort of thing. And so this confectionery company had this really clever idea to make a alco- essentially alcohol-free beer that you could drop a shot of shochu into to give yourself a drink because shochu was very low tax. And um, that became hoppy. So hoppy is essentially, it's I think it's a 0.8% beer yeah. or malt beverage. Yeah. And you get it with a in an ice cold mug with a, with a shot of shochu. And it's just, it's so refreshing and it's so Tokyo. Like yeah. you don't find it in Kyushu. You know, oh, other, you other don't. no other parts of Japan, you just don't see hoppy. Huh. You know, it might, and it's it's sort of like you know when you're in in Tokyo, you can find a satsuma izakaya or an okinawa yeah. izakaya, yeah. so you can get you know those a local drinks. Taste of yeah. yeah. So if somebody's doing like a Tokyo themed izakaya in Kyushu, you might find hoppy, but other huh. than that, it's just not around. Oh, that's funny. And so when I come to Tokyo, I I tend to drink it just because it's it's almost nostalgia, even yeah. though I didn't grow up post war Japan. It, yeah, there's something there's something about it. There really is. Oh, what I like to do with it is actually, so there's hoppy regular and hoppy black. And so hoppy black, I, I drink with kokuto shochu. Yeah. So the, the the black sugar shochu from Amami. Yeah. And it just really becomes this rich drink. And it, with the roasted malts of the black, the black hoppy, it's really nice. And then I tend to drink like a light 
barley shochu with the with the uh, regular hoppy because that mimics beer, right? That's it's it's all grains, it's all it's all barley. Yeah. So uh, it's a really fun drink. Yeah, know? absolutely. Uh, so much about the experience of a drink really extends beyond the liquid in the bottle or the glass or the you know the cup, um, whatever you're sipping on, and. Maybe this is just personal experience and just the people around me, but I find a lot of the people who come to Japan, not just who live here, but visitors as well too, a lot of people fall in love with drinking in Japan. And sure, they like they enjoy a good shochu or a good sake, but there's something about drinking in Japan that just feels good, that resonates with people. What is that? What was... Is there... Have you yeah. experienced that or in, in kind of going back and revisiting all these things? Did you get a... Absolutely. I think, you know, the the first chapter of the book, actually, it's it's an untitled chapter, is really an introduction to sort of drinking culture in Japan. Uh, and it's, it's, a, um, it's a fascinating place to drink. And I think part, you know, Japanese people are very hardworking, very serious most of the time. And so... And it's really that drinking is when people can let their hair down. They can loosen their collar and take their tie off and, and have a drink and enjoy themselves. And, and there's something about the energy of, of being in that environment. You know, we, we have that in the West, mm. but we, I think we start from a more casual position and then mm. it's not such a big leap yeah. to the bar. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where in Japan, it's almost, um, I think it's almost therapeutic yeah. in many ways. Yeah. I had a, professor i mentioned this in the in the chapter a professor at kyushu university who talks about the izakaya as the safe haven between the stresses of work and the stresses of home <laughs> and it really is yeah. it's like a, it's a way station for you to sort of wash away you know all the stress of of your deadlines at work and you know your fight with your boss or the disagreements with your coworkers or whatever to getting home and having a you know a sick child or helping your your kid with their homework yeah. or a wife yep. who's been doing housework all day yeah. and you know is upset or whatever and so yeah. it's there's something about it in japan that is is different than it is drinking other places of course we could have the same concept i mean that's a happy hour for us yeah in the yeah. west yeah but in japan there's just something it just sort of sits in a in a sort of a different place almost it does yeah. Yeah. and also the, there's also the element of food i mean japanese yeah. don't tend to just go out and have a drink yeah and this was a hard lesson for me early on because when i started making japanese friends as i got into shochu they'd say oh let's go out for a drink tonight or you know next week or whatever and to me that meant like have something to eat at home before you yeah. went out for drinks <laughs> and so i'd show up full and then they'd order all this food yeah <laughs> and i'd be having two dinners yeah, 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 yeah. and i very quickly realized when japanese people say let's go out for a drink they mean let's go uh, out let's for go dinner and drink spend some time right yeah right. absolutely uh because we very often you know in this in in the states or in the west you'll just go out drinking separate those two right. things yeah yeah like i've got friends from london who you know they'll go out for for a pint and they just drink beer all night and there's, yeah. there's no food involved yeah which yeah. to me just sounds dangerous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I've, I've really grown accustomed to the Japanese drinking style of food and, and drink together. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a very enjoyable experience for sure. Absolutely. And, and part of the process of making this, were there any beverages that you either discovered or rediscovered in a new light that kind of, that got you excited again or that might be staples on your, on your own personal? Yeah. So um, I, I would say, so I actually was very interested in craft beer and wine and whiskey before I discovered shochu. Mm. And I really had sort of let those interests kind of fade. Mm. And I would still drink them occasionally in, in the right circumstances. But in doing research about those drinks in Japan really reinvigorated my interest in, in wine and, and beer and whiskey. Um, and then the in the shochu world, I, I had... A relatively dim view of kokuto shochu until i went to amami and actually visited distilleries and had a chance to try yeah. you know the kokuto shochu with the local food yeah. and realizing that even though it's all made with brown sugar i always just thought of it as like a, a light a low proof rum yeah. essentially yeah which i like rum yeah you know it's a nice yeah. drink but to me until you get into like agricole rums mm. rum is rum yeah and so i just had this misconception that kokuto was kokuto yeah. but i tried 
uh, I think 30 or 35 different kokuto shochu over the course of two days. Mm -hmm. And they were all so different. Yeah. And I just have such a now profound appreciation for kokuto shochu cool. after always thinking of it as sort of an afterthought. Like, why is yeah. there a shochu that's made from sugar? You don't yeah. need koji to make yeah. rum. So yeah. why do you need it to make kokuto shochu? Yeah. But there's so much umami and so much depth to those yeah. shochu because of the koji. Yeah. Even though you don't need it for the fermentation, yeah. Yeah. it just makes the drink more interesting. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. You know, one of the fun things in Okinawa with awamori is, uh, so I, I visited Miyakojima, mm. and on that island, it's such a small island with, I think, around 25,000 people maybe. And they have a system where you can store your clay jar mm. of awamori in the distillery storeroom. Yeah. And when you're having a party or something, they'll deliver it to your house. Cool. You drink what you need, and they'll come back and pick it up and take it back and refill it for you. That's cool. And they actually, when I visited uh, one of the distilleries, they actually gave me a five-liter clay mm -hmm. jar. Yeah. This is 2012. Yeah. It's, it's been aging that entire time. So yeah. it's now a, a seven-year-old Kusu yeah. Awamori. Cool. Uh, which I can't wait to get back down there. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And try. Absolutely. Get it delivered. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Bring it to the hotel. And, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you so much for coming and joining us here. Any, any, any final message or anything you want to share with listeners or anything about the book or something you want them to particularly pay attention to or something? Well, I guess, I, I, honestly, I would say if you find any factual errors, <laughs> let me know because there, there very likely will be a second printing and I can mm -hmm. make uh, edits. I found a couple of mistakes, which are like unforced errors. Yeah. Things that I should yeah. have known better, uh, which will be revised in the in the second printing and also three of the bars unfortunately have already closed mm -hmm. so uh we'll re replace those so if you have bar recommendations as well <laughs> uh, you can you're, find you're gonna get a whole lot of emails now. <laughs> yeah, right. um on i guess probably best way to reach me is on instagram or twitter i'm at shochu underscore donji and since Americans seem to have the hardest time pronouncing shochu, I'm going to spell it for you. Yeah, it's S-H-O-C-H-U underscore D-A-N-J-I. Uh, so tweet at me, DM me, comment on a picture, whatever. I'd uh, love to hear from readers what they think of it. Um, as I said, if, if I made mistakes, I want to know. Mm. Um, and I want to fix them. And otherwise, I hope you enjoy. Yeah, excellent. I'm, I'm excited to dive in. Excellent. Stephen, thank you so much for taking the time to come out here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is very exciting. Uh, the Complete Guide to Japanese Drinks by Stephen Lyman, um, together with the help and support of Mr. Chris Bunting. That sound right? Yes. That sound right? <laughs> and I think he would fully approve of that. Statement. He would approve of that one? Okay, excellent. Well, excellent. Yeah, so you can pop online or go to your local bookstore and uh, hunt that down. And if you see, let's say... Share with us your if you have a schedule for your book tours or place you're going to be going or whatever. We'll put that on the on the show notes for the episode. So oh, if sure. there's yeah, when this comes out, we'll let's say we can slip, we can slip this into the next rotation so we can get this out in about a week and a half or so. And so okay, um, we'll get that out there. So yeah. maybe while you're over in the U.S., that some of this information will be out there. So yeah, I know October first will be the Baird Nakamegaro Tap Room. Yeah, uh, October fifth is Knife Nerd in Vancouver. I think the 9th, October 9th, Seattle, there's a new sake bar called, I'll, I'll email you guys, Hanotsu, something like that. Ah. And then Chicago will be at Izakaya Mita, 14th or 15th of October. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember the exact dates. Yeah. And then a uh, couple of events in New York, one at Sakaya, which is a cute yeah. little sake shop in the East Village. Yeah. And then we're doing like a full day blowout at uh, Brooklyn Kura. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Very good. Excellent. Again, congratulations, Stephen. Thank you. Um, and thanks again so much for coming out. And we will come up with an excuse to get you back on the show again here in, uh, sooner rather than later. I'd love to be back. Thank <laughs> Excellent. You. Yeah, thanks so much for coming out. That is the Complete Guide to Japanese Drinks by Mr. Stephen Lyman and Chris Bunting. And this was another episode of Sake on Air. Uh, if you have any thoughts, opinions, feelings about uh, this week's show or any of other of our other shows, you can get in touch with us at questions at sakeonair.com. 
uh, dot com or follow us at at sake on air on facebook instagram twitter uh, all those things you can find us on youtube we got a bunch of for those who prefer having youtube playing in the background while they're at work and that being their um source of uh, audio goodness uh, you can find us you can listen to our episodes on there as well and we are going to be doing a few shows uh, on the road here uh, pretty soon. We'll be back at uh, Aoyama Sake Flea in a couple weeks. That's going to be the weekend of the of October 12th, 13th. Uh, I think we're just going to be there on Sunday this time around. Um, so you can find us there if anybody is kicking around town uh, at that time. And there'll be some little bit of overseas touring, I think, as well, too, in the, in the coming month or so. So a uh, lot to look forward to there. Uh Thanks again to the Japan Sake and Shochu Makers Association for making this possible. And we will see you again in just a couple more weeks. Kanpai.